and welcome to this revision podcast on 20th century medicine. The pace of change was faster in the 20th century, even more so than the 19th century in terms of science and invention. Societies in the 20th century were even richer than in the 1800s. Cities grew even bigger and improved communications actually made the world seem smaller though, spreading ideas and disease faster than ever. There was more time for leisure and less religion and both of these things also affected medicine. Britain became more democratic and people started to strongly believe that the government should look after its people and this is called welfare. The Labour Party and the Liberal Party especially contributed to these changes. Wars, epidemics and famine killed more people in the 20th century than in the whole history of mankind before it. This is partly due to the population explosion that keeps on going even now. War, on the other hand, allowed lots of medical innovation, blood transfusions, penicillin, plastic surgery, drug development and many other things were developed as a result of the two massive world wars in the 20th century. Knowledge about the body massively increased as well. So many new inventions, too many to mention in detail here, but advanced x-rays, cat scans, etc. allowed knowledge of the body, different hormones were discovered, the electron microscope, DNA, stem cells, MRI scans to detect brain activity, the human genome project, all of these helped understanding of anatomy of the human body and in some cases disease as well. Doctors changed hugely. Your doctor now is most likely to be a woman with a whole range of medicines and surgery to help you. Most medicine is done in hospitals because the technology is there, whereas in 1900 your doctor came to see you if you were rich anyway. Doctors are now paid by the government after the introduction of the NHS in 1948. On the whole they are anyway. The doctor now has more education, more knowledge about diseases and different diseases, more different technology to use, and he or she can even refer you to a specialist, usually without you having to pay a massive amount. There are more specialists in different types of diseases, more, in, but also more stress for doctors as well, and some would say that they have less respect now than they did in the 1800s. They are also a part of the Royal Medical Council. Um, I lied. It's a general medical council who can strike you off if you are failing your patients. Much more new research is more easily available and more training is done on hospital wards than ever before. Discovery of vitamins has helped cure some diseases in the 20th century and the discovery of hormones previously mentioned is also used to treat illnesses. For example, insulin for diabetes. Salvasan 606, the first magic bullet, was discovered by Ehrlich and Hatter in 1909 and cured syphilis. This first magic bullet was the first cure instead of prevention, which in had previously been discovered in the form of the vaccination. Following on from Salvasan 606 were Prontosil and other sulfonamides, uh, which are also types of magic bullet that kill different diseases. Despite these magic bullets, Staphylococcus, a dangerous germ that caused a range and still does cause a range of diseases, was still untreatable. People had already realised that natural materials such as moulds could kill germs and this had been since the 1870s. For example Joseph Lister and others realised it but took no further action. Alexander Fleming had treated soldiers with Staphylococcus in World War I and he was determined to research it afterwards and he tested many chemicals to see what would kill it. However penicillin was rediscovered by chance in 1928 when it landed on Alexander Fleming's petri dish by accident when he was on holiday. This was the first antibiotic, a natural substance that kills bacteria, that was discovered as an antibiotic. Other things that had antibiotic properties such as honey had been used since the Egyptian times. Anyway, Fleming published his findings 
He grew more. He squeezed juice from it and used it as an antiseptic, not realising it could be used as an antibiotic inside the body. Um, he and other people gradually forgot about it, as there were better antiseptics than this. But Florian Chain, whilst making a list of all nat natural substances that can kill germs, had found Fleming's research whilst they were studying at Oxford University, and they developed his research as an antibiotic. They tested the small amount they had on mice and then on a human. But they needed much more to cure him completely, and unfortunately he died. But World War II helped fund mass production as the US government paid chemical companies to grow it in massive vats. And by all accounts, 15% of soldiers that were injured in World War II were saved by penicillin. After the war, it became available to doctors and other antibiotics followed, although now many diseases are res resistant to penicillin, for example the MRSA superbug. The pharmaceutical industry are constantly researching new drugs and they spend a huge amount on technology and research teams to develop cures and vaccines. However, they charge a lot for these drugs and make billions of pounds from them. In 1954, there was a vaccine for polio. In 1952, the first sex change happened. In the 1950s, contraception was, um, or better contraception was discovered. More, in more recent times, we've had other discoveries such as incubators and pacemakers. Genetic diseases are still a problem, as are viruses such as HIV or AIDS and the common cold or flu, influenza. The two wars saw the birth of plastic surgery with Harold Gillies and Archibald Mackindale. In 1967, Christian Barnard did the first heart transplant and the patient lived for 18 days. More and more transplant is now possible and keyhole surgery is also possible. However, people are still using alternative medicine, much like they have done throughout the whole of history, for example, aromatherapy, acupuncture, homeopathy and hypnotherapy all tried to cure the patient as a whole rather than battering the patient with drugs often which have many side effects. Public health in the 20th century changed quite a bit. The government had accepted the need to care for people from the cradle to the grave in the UK and plus the people had now got the vote including from 1918 onwards women had got the vote. Two men called Charles Booth and Seabone Roundtree investigated and published reports that proved conditions had not improved that much since Chadwick's times and his report in some places. In 1899, 163 babies out of every thousand died before the age of one. In some places it was even worse. Poor conditions were still going on and poor feeding as well as these conditions, led to the shocking death of baby figures, otherwise known as infant mortality rates. Liberal reforms of the liberal reforms of 1906 to 1914 set up some free medical treatment and sick pay, as well as medical examinations for school kids, free school meals, and banning selling tobacco to children. And this partly came about because the Boer War had revealed that despite the Public Health Act of 1875, half the population of Britain were unfit to fight in the army. In 1919, homes for hero heroes were promised after World War I, and this led to a clear out of the slums. The Ministry of Health was set up in 1919 as well to look after sanitation, as well as the training of doctors and nurses. The Second World War helped as well because during that, a government issued report by William Beveridge recommended that there should be a welfare state that would deal with five big evils want, ignorance, squalor, idleness, and most applicable to us, disease. New towns were uh, created to get rid of squalor, and these include Telford, um, Milton Keynes, and um, Slough. And they were to get rid of the slums around Birmingham and London especially. In 1948, the NHS, or National Health Service, was set up by Nye Bevan. And uh, he was part of the new Labour government who um, followed the Beveridge Report. This changed what was an inconsistent approach to medicine. 
It was now to be free at the point of service. People would pay for it instead with taxes. It also provided health care from the cradle to the grave. For example, in other words, all the way through life. And now, the infant mortality rate is only 5.2 in every thousand. The welfare state also brought in family allowance payments, which were given out for the first time. And benefits were given out for the really poor, both of which improved the general health of the public. Because they became richer. These are still controversial issues, and they cost lots of money. And people often argue about how much everyone should spend in their taxes on these things because you might never ever need to use them, but you still have to pay for them. But it does mean that no one is left without help at all. In the 1960s, new hospitals were built, and from 1989, there's been some sort of competition between hospitals to drive up standards. Although scandals like the Stafford Hospital case recently show that the NHS is still far from perfect. Communication such as the TV and internet make it easier to educate the general public on how to look after themselves and when to get tests at the doctors and things like that. And schools now have a role in health education in PSHE. The government spends a huge amount of money too in research of new drugs, new technology, screening and just general care of the population.